black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Professor Emily J. Lordy, who's Associate Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. She's the author of several books, The Great Black Resonance, Iconic Women Singers in African-American Literature, published by Rutgers in 2013, Donnie Hathaway Live, which was part of the Bloomsbury 33 and a Third series, which was published in 2016, and the brand new The Meaning of Soul, Black Music and Resilience since the 1960s, published by Duke University Press. Of The Meaning of Soul, as Andrea Robinson writes, an exquisite work of sound scholarship, The Meaning of Soul offers a new narrative of soul music that compels us to rethink what we have missed about the genre and the political moment it inhabited. How are you doing today, Professor Lordy? Pretty good, thanks. How are you? I'm good. It's great to have you on the show again. Um, you know, you start the book uh, talking about a, a genealogy of soul, and, and I do want to talk about that in a moment. But I want to start by asking you about a genealogy of you as a listener mm-hmm. of, of soul music, uh, what that process has looked for you as a scholar, but also obviously as a fan. Yeah, sure. So, um Gosh, it's kind of hard to to trace it back, you know, to to pinpoint a particular origin, you know, where I began listening um, intently and enthusiastically to soul music. But I will say, um, you know, that it it really probably started for me um, in terms of my scholarly interest in soul with the last chapter of my first book, Mm -hmm. which, as you know, was interdisciplinary. Um, analysis of both Nikki Giovanni and Aretha Franklin. And that was so exciting to me just to really start to listen in the way that we had been trained to do to other canonical women singers like Billie Holiday and Bessie Smith. Um, But to start to to really pay that kind of close and rigorous um, analytical attention to the musical production of Aretha Franklin. And and also seeing that, you know, not that much work had really been, been done around around her as a figure in, in terms of the you know the scholarship um and and so just you know being so excited and inspired i guess to do that kind of close listening work that that i guess would be sort of the the origin story um it's not really like particularly personal i guess or um i don't know like exciting origin story but but that that's really where it began it began with you know, the first book, which was my dissertation, you know, and, and which was really the seed of everything that has come after. Yeah. You know, as you mentioned throughout the book, you know, so soul is an interesting term, right? Because it, it means so many things in some cases to many people. And, and, and as you offer a corrective in the book, you know, sometimes when we talk about soul, we stop talking about music <laughs> and, and we're always talking about these other things um but but i want to sit a moment with a, a section of the book where you talk about trying to describe what soul is and 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 the old adage as as you talk about in the book you even quote tanisha ford you know is saying is that you know very often when folks are asked about soul music particularly if they're not musicologists and musicians it's a response that's like you know it when you hear it right you know it when you see it you know it when you taste it for a moment uh sit with this idea of knowing it <laughs> you know when you see it or when you hear it when you taste it and what that meant for you theoretically to chart out a notion of what soul music was yeah absolutely um so i guess I should say that part of my interest as a scholar has always been in trying to really concretize these commonly used terms and, um, you know, almost like the the, the commonplaces of, of a particular tradition, right? Um, so in my first book, that meant looking at, you know, how people continuously describe Billie Holiday's voice as haunting, right? That becomes a, a commonplace thing to say. Or Billie Holiday sang her life, you know, or, you know, just just all the the kind of um, all those cliches, really, of of the the discourse and wanting to to really ask the question of, like, what do people mean by that? Number one, like, what exactly is she doing with her voice that makes that creates that haunting effect? Um, And then, two, like, what are the what are the politics behind deciding to describe her voice in that way? So it's sort of a discourse analysis, right? It's what is the social utility of this story? Another good example of this would be the story of, you know, Bessie Smith dying on the side of the road because, right. you know, or, or dying on the way to the, the White Hospital because refused by 
um, the, the sort of white people at this particular hospital that people drove her to after this fatal car accident that didn't have to be fatal, but you know, again, she was she was turned away. Um, Bessie Smith's biographer, you know, had really done done some research on that and discovered that that isn't really true, and that you know the people in the, the deep south at this point are not going to bring Bessie Smith to the White Hospital. But nonetheless, that story circulates, and so it's more important for me to ask why does it circulate, right? Like, what is the work that that particular story is doing than it is to just say, oh, well, that that's not actually factually true, right? There's a truth to it that is not necessarily about factual accuracy. It's about the way, it's about the truth of that black life, right? And, and it's a story that people tell in order to tell the story of, um, in order to tell that particular truth. And so when I'm looking at soul, I'm asking, you know, what exactly, what exactly is the, this sort of, um, what are the politics of these claims about if you have to ask, you'll, you know, you'll never know, no, or right, you just kind right. of know you see it. And I, I was interested in specifically the ways that that discourse was about a, a kind of claiming of black space. It was, it was a way of marking black space and of saying, if you, you know, oftentimes the kind of white uh, public, you know, that was particularly fascinated by this phenomenon called soul, you know, because of the rise of these you know, incredible soul artists. If you really have to sit there and ask what it is, then then you don't get to know, right? Um, and so it's it's sort of asking the question of, you know, what is the work that, that that claim is doing? But then also saying, you know, what do we miss when we just decide that, you know, if you have to ask, you'll never know. Like what what really might might we discover when we ask the question of, okay, but but what what not necessarily what is soul, but but what are the kinds of um, the, the common tropes that we find when people are writing around it, even if they're not explicitly defining it. And one of those tropes for me was the trope of black resilience, right? That whatever else people say about soul, often it is about, they're, they're talking about this sense of having gained something through historical and present struggles that are particular to black people as a group. So it's a kind of what I call almost like secular payoff, right? That before we might understand in a kind of religious context. Um, but now is sort of moving out of um, black religious spaces and becoming um, a kind of secular redemption narrative that people are using in order to, again, sort of mark black space, affirm themselves as belonging to a group and also just fortify themselves, you know, for the challenges um, of this particularly um, sort of perilous and pressurized political moment. You know, one of the big interventions that you make throughout the book is is in this concept of what you call misremembering, mis right? Correcting both the misremembering of what soul music is, but also in terms of the political realities that create soul. Uh, can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, sure. You know, I sort of came into the field at a moment where um, there was something called, you know, as of course, you know, um, post soul theory. Mm -hmm. And, and you've been obviously an important innovator of, of that theory. And the book is, I should also say, just indebted to, to you and your work and in so many levels, but, but one of which is your theorization of post soul aesthetics, um, which I took to be this moment of, of sort of saying, you know, what is particular, what is unique about this kind of post civil rights, post black power, black cultural production, right? Um, and you were, you know, you had a very nuanced understanding of what that was, you know, for good and for ill. Um, what I found sort of coming at this or coming into the field at a slightly um, later moment was that that nuance and that complexity around the question of the post soul had really been kind of ironed out. And it had become, the, you know, the question of what is problematic about this moment, right, or what has been lost in this post-revolutionary moment you know of integration and whatnot that those questions sort of ceased to be asked in instead what we were getting was this kind of celebratory valedictory you know understanding of postal as the liberated alternative to this like repressive restrictive oh, gotcha. soul yeah. so that was what i was thinking about in terms of soul having been misremembered and you know it, it's sort of the question of um you know to whose in whose interest is soul being posited as this restrictive formation, right? And again, what do we miss when we um, when we just think about postal as as you know the, the better thing that came afterward as opposed to something that um, was was more kind of complicated. Um, so that was the kind of the scholarly impetus be, behind asking what is soul itself because it's easy to treat it as this kind of foil to post soul if we don't ask you know. But but what what was soul and what were people doing? Yeah. What actually people were doing like they were theorizing this concept and making this music. 
Yeah, it, it, it reminds me similarly of the work of someone like Ashley Farmer, you know, who in many of the critiques of the Black nationalist movement and the Black power movement, um, you know, we read the kind of gender politics into that. And someone like Ashley has actually recovered women who were on the ground doing important work, who just were, as you would say, misremembered, <laughs> you know, out of that political moment. Um, you know, you choose several ways to, to look at soul music, right? Through the cover, through ad-libs, through falsetto, um, false endings, which, you know, I told you even when you were working on the book, you know, how much I actually enjoyed that, that concept. Uh, but I want to talk about the covers piece for a moment, and particularly one of the covers that you write about, um, Rotary Connections um, cover of Respect. And, and, and I would argue, you know, Aretha notwithstanding, um, that, you know, their cover might be the best cover of that song. Um, and of course, it's fraught with this whole larger history because many folks are, are unaware <laughs> that Aretha's version was actually a cover of the song also. So talk about your, your choice of Rotary Public and, of course, the great Minnie Riperton in the context of this. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, you know, as I said, um, my first book was really thinking about uh, Black women singers. Um, and as I didn't say, in conversation with, you know, kind of canonical African-American writers and understanding or, or making the argument that we can understand these singers' innovations, you know, formally, politically, aesthetically, as just as um, significant, inventive, experimental as those of their more, um, you know, sort of legitimated, quote unquote, uh, literary peers, right? Um, and so I was doing that work around Aretha and I continued to do it in, in this book as well, you know, not only in the first book, but I, I continued to do it in the soul book too. But it was fascinating for me and important for me to think about what were the alternatives, even in that moment to Aretha Franklin's, you know, yeah. obvious prowess and, you know, like dominatingly incredible uh, vocal work and, you know, work on the piano and just, you know, musicianship in general. Um, Minnie Riperton offers a kind of alternative and therefore helped me to make the bigger argument that soul encompassed far more kind of aesthetic and political mm -hmm. uh, work and, and meanings than I think, again, that misremembering has encouraged us to see. So what I loved about that, you know, about the Minnie Riperton Rotary Connection cover of Respect is that, again, Aretha Franklin has come out in 1967 and, and just created this version of the song that it kind of blew Otis Reddings out of the water. It's iconic, yeah. I love, you know, Nikki Giovanni talks about people, you know, kind of first hearing Aretha's cover and, and you know, it was like a word of mouth type of thing. Like, did you hear what Aretha did with Otis's song? Like, did you hear? You know, it was like all the rage. You know, it was like, this is what people were talking about. And and it, and it was instrumental to her being crowned, of course, the queen of soul, you know, but, but what about the kind of, I don't know, the other people in the court, right? The princesses of soul, right? The other people who are on the margins and, you know, people, people also, you know, talk about this, you know, for example, in the documentary, uh, what is it, 20 Feet from Stardom, um, and the way in which Aretha's dominance could actually crowd out some people who either sounded a little bit like her, you right. know. Um, the but Mary Clayton's and the folks that, like that, yeah. Exactly. Or people yeah. who are offering, you know, a sort of um, compelling alternative. Um, but Minnie Riperton and Rotary Connection hear Aretha's version, of course. And yet, rather than being daunted by it and feeling like, okay, well, you know, that, that's that been done, right? Um, that's been sort of thoroughly <laughs> covered, so to speak. They're like, yeah, that's a that's great, you know. And as uh, one of the front men, Sydney Barnes, told me when I asked him, you know, was this daunting to you, or did you think you were kind of doing something really, um, I don't know, kind of big and scary and covering the song? He said, you know, not at all. He said it was such a great song that we figured that how could we possibly mess it up? And that that was, you know, that's one way of understanding um, what they were doing is just that they wanted to create, you know, their own version of this obviously great song. It wasn't about, you know, trying to unseat Aretha or you know, do something that was that was competitive. Um, but at the same time, I think 
I know actually Minnie Riperton from her public statements was explicitly um, understanding herself as as not Aretha. You know, she's, she's saying I don't have to sound like that. You know, I'm a black woman singer and I have my own aesthetic and I have my own training and tradition. You know, and I can sort of do me. And so the the story of how Minnie Riperton gets to do her eventually um, is one of the stories that I wanted to tell in the book. Yeah. Uh, you have a chapter on falsettos, and, and very often I think when we think about soul, falsettos, particularly the soul tradition, we're thinking about male singers. Um, you think about folks, you know, the Eddie Kendricks and the Ted Mills and, and those folks who we think of as kind of great falsettos in the tradition. You know, you talk about Al Green in the book and, and someone that we don't normally think about in terms of falsetto, in terms of Isaac Hayes and particularly the work that he does in Moses. But the most of the singers that you talk about in terms of falsetto in this chapter are actually women singers. So talk a little bit about the gender dynamics of looking at women who sing falsetto versus men who sing falsetto. Yeah, sure. So um, the way that men's falsettos had often been described in the scholarship on soul had been, um, you know, as a, as a yearning, as a longing, you know, um, as a, a pleading type of type of thing. And I think that that's that's completely legitimate. But I wanted to talk about black women's use of falsetto as a performance of plenitude, as a performance of abundance, as a performance of yes. aspiration and insistence on sort of going where, you know, maybe you didn't know that you could go or nobody expected you to go. I mean, Minnie Riperton's whistle register being the iconic example of this, right? Yep. Like who expects, right. Right. Who expects her to flip into that range? Um, and so some people, you know, our, our friend Guy Ramsey actually sort of took issue with my um, decision to even call women singers use of this higher register falsetto. Um, I think that there's some musicological contestation around whether one can call this flip into a higher vocal register falsetto when it's performed by a woman. But in my understanding, it is obviously a false register, right? That, in other words, I think that the reason why people don't often associate the falsetto with women is because it's assumed that women have naturally high voices and it's not a false etymology of the term. It's not a false register for them. But, but you know, when Minnie moves from this like growling tone up, you know, into her chest voice and, and then into the stratosphere, I think we can see that as, as falsetto. Um, and when Ann Peebles does the same, this very kind of um, dramatic vocal flip on the word rain in her, in her recording of I Can't Stand the Rain, I, I wanted to see that as falsetto too. I can't stand the rain Against my window Bringing back sweet memories Hey, window pain When we think about the women of soul um, the, and their aesthetic practices, right? Not just the lyrical content of their songs, but what they're doing with their voices and the kinds of ways that they're experimenting, you know, and, and creating, um, we can often tell a different story about the meaning of the, of the meaning of the music and the complexity and the internal kind of um, complexity and the nuance and the, the different kinds of dynamics um, that we can hear when we listen closely to the music and think about, again, like the, the gendered um, specificity of some of these practices and, and songs. Yeah. You know, as you went about the work of, of writing The Meaning of Soul, uh, were there any assumptions about what you were going to find that, quite frankly, you were surprised when your listening practices or your research practices simply took you in a totally different direction? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because I started out, you know, wanting to contest the pretty staid kind of received narrative that soul music is simply a mouthpiece for civil rights or black power, right? That what soul artists are doing, that the most interesting way that we can understand what they're doing is that, you know, Aretha Franklin is supporting Martin Luther King or, mm -hmm. Um, Stan Cook is reporting that change is going to come, or Nina Simone is doing this to be goddamn. Um, and I wanted to to show that you know there there are other kind of internal politics. That, that first of all, the politics of soul are not solely oppositional. They're not solely about contesting the white gaze or white power, right? Um, but but also just saying that you know again this this music can have important social meaning um, even when the lyrical content is not explicitly like say a lot of that, right? Um, but so what surprised me is actually just discovering more and more um, the social activism of these artists, right? Yeah. 
you know, I, I have to say, I didn't know, you know, the the kind of on the ground grassroots organizing work that somebody like an Isaac Hayes was doing. In mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand. I didn't fully appreciate the ways that these these were race men and race women. You know, mm-hmm. Sonny Hathaway, people who you don't even necessarily, a lot of people might not necessarily associate with kind of radical black politics or nationalist politics of the period, that even if it wasn't in their music, it was in their personal life, it was in some of their um, comments to the press, and it was in the in the more kind of um, hard to archive perhaps, um, or analyze, or pin down ways of simply being in the world and of organizing a band, for example, right? Yeah, right. Deciding who your manager is going to be. Like all of these things are, are political practices that these artists were engaging in, in the interest of kind of black world making and black liberation um, that I was really surprised and, and kind of um, moved to discover. Yeah. I want to switch gears a little bit for a moment. Um, you were able to write a, a fantastic profile of, of uh, Dolly Parton um, in the end of 2020, um, right there in Nashville. Talk a little bit about the experience of um, engaging such an iconic figure uh, and what it was like to write about her, particularly on a platform like the New York Times. Yeah, sure. So um, that was an unusual <laughs> assignment for sure. Um, you know, I haven't really done a lot of work on um, non-Black artists, honestly. I haven't published a lot of work. Um, but it was informed nevertheless. I mean, I kind of feel like training in Black studies kind of gives one access to, um, you know, the, the world in, in a way. You know, I mean, I don't mean to sound too grandiose about it, but it, it, it trains one into a certain way of seeing the world and asking certain questions about for example, the stories that are untold, right? So as much as Dolly Parton is an iconic figure, um, I was driven to ask about the things, you know, the, the aspects of her work and her art that, that had been, I think, uh, sort of really tragically understudied, right? I.e. as a songwriter, you know, the labor right. performance, um, right. those kinds of things. So in other words, you know, although Dolly Parton was an unusual subject for me, um, my, my approach to her was, was very like on brand. Yeah. You know, right, right, I'm going to ask her about her music. I'm going to ask her about the process of creating it. And and the last thing that I guess I'll say about that is that you know I I really and again this, my training as a as a scholar of black music and culture has attuned me to this. I'm very skeptical of the search for the real so and so. Right? Like who is the real person behind this public figure? Right. Um, you know, and I think that this is a gendered question. Um, it's it's often a race question. But but the thing about it is that. I, you know, I think that the best way, if we're if we're actually interested in, in asking that question, um, we're pursuing you know some some aspect or some dimension of the, the you know iconic artist that hasn't been tapped before. The best way to do that is to ask about the thing that they spend all their time doing, which is making work. You know, um, and so I just think that that's a kind of a revelatory approach, and that that's you know what I asked her about. And yeah, I mean it was it was a trip for sure to actually like get to be in her presence. But to be perfectly honest, I think it was to my advantage that I hadn't grown up you know thinking that she was like this this goddess figure. So I, I wasn't right. like cowed. I was just sort of right. like I was intrigued. Yeah. Um, also, you're co-editing a new series uh, through Duke University called Singles. Could you talk a little bit about that series? Yeah, sure. The Singles series is a series of books, short, like 30,000 word books on particular songs. Um, so it's somewhat like the uh, British Film Institute series of books that are on particular films and 33 and a third series of books that are on specific iconic albums. Um, but this is just looking at the the lives, the many lives that, that particular songs can take in, in culture, right? So, you know, the, the first iteration of the song, the covers of the song, the way that that song, you know, what it kind of means to people who live with it and, and kind of through the time that it might um, characterize, right? Or shape in a certain way. And we haven't had any, uh, our books are, you know, beginning to come out. The, the first one I think will be out in the spring of this year, 2021. Um, but we have several, you know, people who are writing for us and I think it's gonna be um, really exciting. And, and yeah, I mean, if, if people are interested, they can contact me and I can tell them all about how to send a proposal and how to kind of get this, um, get the process going. What's next for you, Emily? Um, what's next for me? Well. You know, I, I don't really have another book in me right now. Um, I don't know that the books are, I, I think, you know, we're probably different in this regard, but but I don't think that books are necessarily like my my strong suit. Um, I can I can do a book, you know, and I can I can do a book that sort of 
cobbled together. This is not to be unnecessarily self-deprecating, but but it's just to say that you know I, I think of a book as a series of, of close readings, really. Yeah. Um, right. But I don't I don't feel right now that I have a grand ambition to tackle a book length subject. Um, but what I do, what I am really interested in, is becoming a much better essayist, a much better interviewer, and I you know perhaps a writer of profile. So I'm turning right now to more journalistic work and it's a whole other I mean in some ways it's very familiar you know it's, it's about writing it's about researching it's about you know trying to say something new and something important um, and lift people up right that, that haven't necessarily gotten the kind of attention um, that they deserve um, but it's also very different you know it's a different ball game and just understanding like what and I what is a good idea you know like what is a story pitch these are you know things that I, I'm still right having to learn, um, but happily so. And, and it's, it's exciting to, you know, try to kind of take on this new, um, or, or move into this slightly different direction. You're listening or watching Left of Black. We were joined today by Professor Emily J. Lordy, Associate Professor of English, soon to be full professor at Vanderbilt University. She is the author most recently of The Meaning of Soul, Black Music and Resilience Since the 1960s, published by Duke University Press. It's always great to talk with you, Emily. Thanks for joining us again on Left of Black. Thanks for having me, Mark. Black lights and boots burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back. 